Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us today. My name is Joanne Bowman, and I'm here with the God Home Campaign Group. Uh, we represent over 53 organizations and individuals who want to make sure that our governor knows that we do not want our National Guard deployed this summer. We believe that he has a responsibility to make sure that the Guard is here to take care of our emergencies at home. And quite frankly, we feel that our National Guard has served above and beyond. And so we feel like they've served their country well, and they should stay here in Oregon. Um, this is actually part of a national effort. Here in Oregon, we started this effort in May of 2008. What you're going to hear today is that we have collected signatures from over 7,000 Oregonians who share our vision of keeping our National Guard here. Um, and we are part of a national campaign that kicked off this morning at 10.30 a.m. in Washington, D.C. And so communities just like ours are stepping up to say, we have served well, but it's time for us to rethink our strategy, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan and any other place that people might want to send our National Guard. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, uh, the speakers that will be speaking today. I have very short bios that I will read first. They will come up individually and talk about uh, their particular component of this piece. I also want to bring to your attention an LC uh, copy, which is LC1122, uh, that Dan Handelman will talk more about when he comes up. And so this is a legislative draft that will turn into a legislative bill that we uh, expect <coughs> action to be taken upon. And so our speakers today for the program will start with Dan Handelman. He's a founding member of Peace and Justice Works in Portland, and he's the state coordinator of the campaign to keep Oregon's God in Oregon. And let me have Dan come up, and then I'll come back and introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joanne. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good, Good afternoon morning. now. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, the campaign to keep Oregon's God in Oregon. And as Joanne mentioned, we are part of this national effort. And the national effort is called Bring the Guard Home, It's the Law. And the purpose and the, and the premise of the campaign is that the authorization for use of military force in Iraq has expired. And therefore, it is no longer legal for the Guard to be deployed to Iraq. Uh, in Oregon, we also added to the national campaign the war in Afghanistan, which is also under an authorization for use of military force whose terms, rather than having expired, are too broad. If we were challenging a search warrant, for instance, from the police, we, weren't be, we wouldn't be challenging the right of the police to have a search warrant. So we're not necessarily challenging the right of the United States to call up the Guard. We understand there are laws in place about that. What we're saying is that these two instances particularly, and perhaps in the future if this isn't stopped, that the federal government will continue to call the guard up on either under authorizations which have expired, such as in Iraq, where there were very specific guidelines that the Congress laid out. Those guidelines were to protect America from the threat posed by the Iraqi government, the Iraqi government that has since been deposed and is no longer there, and to enforce Security Council resolutions against that government of Iraq. And those Security Council resolutions are no longer in force or need to be enforced by, by military violence. So the Iraq authorization has expired, and the Afghan authorization says that the president can name any country he wants and say that that country is housing people who had something to do with 9-11. And 9-11 was over seven years ago at this point, and we still have US military planes dropping bombs in Pakistan uh, and uh, in Somalia in other countries under this premise of this so-called war on terror, which unless that authorization is revisited, will go on forever and allow a, a continual deployment of the Guard, which is not what the Guard was meant for. Getting back to the search warrant analogy, if a search warrant was issued that was so broad uh, that the police could look for anything anywhere at any time, a uh, judge would certainly reject that. Uh, once, once the Items that are in the search warrant have been found. That search warrant is over, and another one has to be uh, issued. So 
unless the Congress issues a new authorization, and I want to make clear that the Status of Forces Agreement that went into effect in Iraq on January 1st was signed by the President of the United States and not the Congress. And the Congress is who, under our Constitution, declares war. And the sections of our law, our public laws and our Constitution that guide the use of the Guard specifically require authorization by Congress to call up our state militia and use them for the National Guard purposes. We're asking the legislature to pass two measures. Um, one would be the, uh, the bill that Joanne uh, mentioned <coughs> before, which is now known as uh, LC, thank you, Joanne, uh, now known as LC 1122, um, and that authorizes the governor to withhold the Guard uh, without a constitutionally authorized federal directive. Uh, and the second piece of, uh, the second measure we're asking to be passed is a re resolution that calls upon the governor to use this law with regards to Iraq and Afghanistan. So if there are any, uh, any questions about the legal basis or of the campaign, I'm glad to take them after we're done with our presentation. Thank you. I want to take this moment to let you know who is in the room today. We have representatives from Peace and Justice Works, Iraqi Affinity Group, uh, Progressive Response, a program of Community <coughs> Alliance of Lane County. Uh, we have Oregon Peace Works. We have Code Pink from Cavallis. We have Oregon Action. We have Rural Organizing Project. We have Pacoon. We have Veterans for Peace, Chapter 72. We have Iraqi Veterans Against the War, Oregon Chapter, and Military Families Speak Out, Oregon, and others uh, chapters. We also want to make sure that uh, we acknowledge uh, the work of some of our ally organizations who, were, who live too far to be able to be here today. And those organizations include uh, Central Oregon Peace Network from Ben, uh, it includes the Southern Oregon Jobs with Justice chapter that operates out of Ashland and the Rogue Valley Veterans for Peace chapter 156 from Grants Pass. And we want to thank them for their support and their help in collecting the signatures that we'll be delivering today. Next, I want to introduce Adele Kubain of Military Families Speak Out, Oregon. Uh, she's the mother of an Oregon Guards member who was permanently disabled in Iraq. She is on the National Board of Military Families Speak Out and a resident of Corvallis. Please, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Um, this is a very personal campaign for me. In 1998, my daughter joined the Oregon National Guard. She was 20 years old in a marine biology program at Oregon State University. She was handsome and strong. When I told her I was worried and I asked her why was she doing it, she told me that she wanted to serve the people of Oregon. She wanted to fight fires and keep Oregon's roads in good shape. She said that the people of Oregon had given so much to her by helping her with her education that she felt that she wanted to give back. She says, oh, I'm going to learn how to fix the diesel engines in my research vessels. She said, I'll learn all kinds of stuff and I'll do a lot of good things. But instead of serving the people of Oregon, she ended up getting shot down in a helicopter over Iraq. Now she spends her days hobbling around in pain and her nights in dreams of blood. All of this would have been acceptable if she had been protecting and serving the people of the state of Oregon in a legal action for a legitimate reason. When I read this proposed bill, I realized that not only is the war illegitimate, but so is the deployment of our best public servants the people who are ready to fight our fires, clear our landslides, and give their lives to assist and protect us. Instead of anger at the destruction of our lives, I find resolve. The National Guard no longer has a mission in Iraq, and they do not yet have a legitimate one in Afghanistan. Please join with me to support this bill and resolution. We are delivering nearly 7,500 petitions signed by people from Astoria to Baker City, from Bandon to Pendleton, signatures from every le legislative district. People who signed the petition include Representative Carolyn Tomei, U.S. Congressman Kurt Schrader, and former State Senator Pete Sorensen. 
If our governor cannot bring himself to stand up for justice, then we must help him to refuse another call up of the Oregon National Guard. My daughter has given back so much more than she received. How many more Oregon families will have to grieve before we do what is right by our people and by our state? Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Benji Lewis. He's a community activist and a current war resistor, a founding member of Iraqi Veterans Against the War Oregon, and a former Marine Corps corporal who served in Fallujah and, don't, can't rec uh, in, in Iraq. Please, uh, welcome. Hi, I'm Benji Lewis, and I did serve in Fallujah and Hadith, Iraq. And uh, just recently, I've been involuntarily activated into the Marine Corps to serve again. And I am current war resistor, resisting on many of the same basis that the Guard Home Campaign is based upon. And to a veteran who is serving overseas, fighting for the notions of democracy and freedom, it isn't until after I've left the service I've realized what those notions are. And what we're doing with the Guard Home Campaign is very exciting because we are revisiting those very questions <coughs> that democracy was laid upon. That we are a nation of laws and that to be successful we must abide by those laws that we have set up and drafted. So we are challenging not to, uh, the uh, war on terror specifically, but the mandates behind it. Uh, as when we left for Iraq a long time ago, many people felt that was necessary to get some recourse for 9-11. And we found out later that Iraq had no bearing on that. So we continue to uh, try to get the voices of the people heard. And the voices of the people are the voices in Congress, our representatives. And legislative processes have always been an important part of the democratic process. The former administration has wrested away some of that power. The checks and balances system has started to slack a little bit. And we are hoping to come here today and tighten that up. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Dan Mayhew. He's the father of an Oregon National Guard 41st <coughs> Brigade soldier who is scheduled to be deployed for the second time in the spring. Good afternoon. I'm Dan, and I'm a proud dad of a proud Oregon National Guard soldier. Uh, back in 2004, my son spent, oh, about 100 years in Iraq, <laughs> at uh, which point we learned a lot. I learned how to get up in the middle of the night and pray for him, and I also learned to avoid the front page of the paper. But there's another thing I did learn. I learned what a fine bunch of folks these guys are, these men and women who were deployed out of Oregon to go and serve the country over there. And from what I have been able to experience from these men and women, I understand that they have done an absolutely fantastic job on what they were called to do. They went over there and they did their duty. They did it. They did it efficiently. They did it competently. They went over with some folks, even in the uh, full-time army, not expecting them to do very well, because after all, they're just National Guard. But they came to respect the way that these men and women from our state did their job and did it well. Now, eventually they came back, most of them. My son lost a lot of good friends when they were at war over there. But the bottom line is they came back in order to say that they had done their job, they have done it well, and now they're going back. And I said, hold it, wait a minute, uh, they've been there, they've done that. My son even sent me a t-shirt. <laughs> and why should they go back when they've already proven who they are and what they stand for? Now I have to tell you something, I'm, I'm here this morning this afternoon uh, with permission. I almost didn't come until I talked to my son about this. And I said to him, I said, I've got this opportunity, should I go? Would that embarrass you? Would it cause a problem for you? And he thought long and hard about it and finally he texted me. <coughs> and I'll just summarize the text message. I got my phone buzzed and I opened it up and I pressed the button. 
and I looked at it. And what he said was something like, I say go for it. He says, that's why I went to Iraq, to fight for people like you to say what they think. And I thought, no, that's professional. <laughs> so we're not questioning the capabilities and the professionalism of our soldiers. What we're asking is, should they be allowed, should they be called upon to leave their families, to leave their education, to leave their jobs, and once again do what they've already done? It's a reasonable question. The question isn't anything less than is it right to ask them to do that. And I don't think so. Particularly when I discovered, you know, that there are conditions that exist in the present deployment that really don't match the conditions that are necessary for National Guard units to be federalized. And so when I heard that really what we needed to be able to do was just tell our governor to authorize him to withhold National Guard troops unless certain specific conditions existed. And we do that through the legislative process. That's what we're involved in here, is to tell the governor, wait a minute, you have you may have authority that you don't know you have. And so we're, that's what we're up to. That's why we're doing this. But the thing, you know, I've heard some people say, now wait a minute, Dan, you don't need to expect people. You don't need to expect the legislature to do that. They're not going to do that because it might jeopardize the flow of federal funds into the state of Oregon. And I said, wait a minute. Are you here to tell me that the state of Oregon is held hostage to federal funds? Do you mean to tell me that we will ask our soldiers to put their life and limb on the line so we can preserve money for, a, for federally funded projects? Because if we are, then we better be also willing to put a commemorative plaque next to a mile of highway or a bridge that our people gave their lives to purchase. And I see some of you are going, That's, that doesn't make sense. And you're absolutely right. I don't think our legislature would think it makes sense. We can't do it. We can't withhold our guard units, or actually send them, is what I mean to say. We can't send our guard units merely to, pre to preserve the flow of federal funds. That doesn't make any sense. We have to ask ourselves what is right. And what is right is to allow our National Guard to stay here where they belong. I've got to tell you something. Last week, somebody was, rec was, was rescued off of Mount Hood with a Black Hawk helicopter. If that happened a year from now, that helicopter probably wouldn't be here. It would, in all likelihood, be overseas. Anybody remember the Guard units that helped the people in Gresham when they were snowed in? They might not have been here. What about Katrina? Our soldiers also went there after the last deployment. If we expect our home front to be cared for, we have to keep the local militias here to do what they were designed to do. And that's why we are so passionate about this particular cause. And we're going to talk to our legislators, and we're going to ask them to take action and authorize the governor to say, no, we're going to keep our guys and our women, men and women, here where they belong. They behave professionally. They did their job well in Iraq. I think we can probably let them stay here and serve the communities that they were called for. And so we will now open up uh, for the media questions from our speakers. Any questions? We were, uh, without getting too technical on the legislative process, we had a, a legislator, um, Representative Chip Shields, who helped draft the bill. He helped get the bill drafted. Uh, and we are going to try to get legislators to sign on as co-sponsors of the bill today and over the coming week and a half before the, uh, the time window closes for in introducing bills. And so we're, we have talked to, I think, almost half the legislators now in the state uh, capitol about this issue, and some of them have said they would co-sponsor, and we just we hadn't had the actual draft of the bill until yesterday, and so now um, we can go back and ask them to sign on. So hopefully you'll, you'll be seeing those names in the next few days. The national campaign, uh, when, when Dan Mayhew so wisely brought up the issue of uh, can they cut off federal funding, one of the advantages to being part of a national campaign is that every state does this, it's going to be very hard for the U.S. government to try to retaliate. And the national campaign at, at present is active in 18 states, and at least 14 of them have a bill being drafted or introduced in the legislature. 
We actually, as a campaign, we met with the governor's staff in September, and we were able to attend uh, the meetings at uh, Camp Homebound, um, whose representatives are also here today, um, was, were able to set. <coughs> Uh, and the gist of what is coming out from the governor's office is they believe that the law restricts them from refusing to send the guard. What they're referring to is some court cases and a, a law called the Montgomery Amendment that says, in essence, I'm paraphrasing, that the governors of the states cannot object to the time, place, or manner of the, uh, of the deployment of their National Guard troops. But what this campaign is about is not about <laughs> objecting to the time, place, or manner of the call-up. It's about the underlying authorization and whether that authorization is constitutional. And that question has never been brought up in court that we know of. And that uh, the question of whether or not the Iraq authorization has expired has never been brought up in court that we know of. And the question of whether the Afghan authorization is too broad and is, creates a perpetual call-up of regard has never been answered in court. So we believe that the governor, uh, as Dan Mayhew said, has powers he doesn't know he has and can do this, but we want the legislature to pass the bills to reinforce that, uh, that ability.